In this video, I will be introducing permutations and combinations and Pascal's triangle and the binomial coefficient theorem. So let's start off with permutations. Say I have 10 runners in a race, right? They're all strutting their legs like that. They're all warming up. 10 of those, okay? And they're all running a race. And say this is the finish line. Okay, what if I wanted to know how many different ways I can get first place, right? How many different ways can I arrange the person who got in first place, person who got in third, second place, person who got in third place? How many different combinations can I get of those? Well, the f any of the first 10 of the first runners could get first, right? At any moment, 10 runners have the ability to get first, right? There's 10 runners in the race. They each have an equal probability if we assume that there is an equal probability for each of them. Okay? Well, how many people can get second place now? Well, one person already crossed first, so there's only going to be nine people left to choose for second. What about third? Well, there's going to be eight people. Eight people left to choose for it. Well, multiply all those together. Right, 10 times 9 times 8, because all of these have to be true, right? What do I get out of that? 7, 20. Okay? But what if I didn't care about the order, right? What if the top three people all went on to the qualifying round, right? So this could be the first, second, third, or something. They all went on to the next round, and I didn't care about the order. How many different sets of three could I send to the next round? Well, let's start with what we had before, 10 times 9 times 8, right? And now I need to account for the fact that I can arrange these in any way I want. So I could have person 1 there, I could have person... 2 here and person 3 here. Or person A, B, and C. A, B, C. Okay? I can arrange this any way I want, and it'll get the same result, right? So I could switch B and C their places. It still wouldn't matter. It's the same set of 3 going to the next round. I could switch B and A now. B and A. Okay. They're still going to the next round. Okay. How many different ways are there to do it? Well, if, if I look at it in the frame that I pick a person to go there, so in this set of three, I pick a person to go there. Well, how many different people could go there? Well, three people could. Okay, now I pick someone to go here. I already used up one, so only two people can go now. Now I pick someone to go there. Well, one person can go there now. So... What I do is I divide it, right? I overcounted. In each of these, there's a set of this, all the permutations of these guys, okay? And so I need to divide to get rid of that ambiguity, right? Okay, I could do 3 there, 5 there, 5, to, uh, five times 8 is 4120. Okay? That significantly decreased it from 720, right? Significantly lower. Okay, what does this have to do with Pascal's triangle? And for that matter, what is Pascal's triangle? So, well, we start with a 1. That one gives birth to two other ones. I said that weird. Okay, now this one gives birth to a 1 there, gives birth to a 1 there. But this one also gives birth to a 1 there, gives birth to a 1 there. Well, 1 plus 1 is 2. Okay, the 1 gives birth to a 1, the 1 gives birth to a 1, 2 gives birth to a 2, and then you have it there, right? Those become 3, those become 3. You can continue that, right? Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm an idiot. Four. 
<laughs> okay, I'm going to stop there just because this makes our point. Say I had one runner. Let's start off with zero runners, right? What if I had zero runners and I picked zero of them? Uh, and zero move on to the next round. Okay. Well, I'm going to have zero, right? Divided by zero, it doesn't work that way, okay? So if I have zero runners and I pick zero of them, how many different ways are there to do that? There's one. Okay? So let's write that down right here. Zero, zero. Okay? Okay, if I had one runner and uh, zero move on, how many different ways are there to do that? Well, one. If I had uh, three runners... And two moved on. Right? Well, then I do three times two divided by two times one. That's going to give us a three. Well, if I look at this, zero, one, two. Three right there. Okay? Yeah, what if I did four runners and two move on? Right? Well, I do four times three divided by two times one. It's going to be 2 times 3 equal to 6. Well, if I do 0, 1, 2, right there, in the fourth row. So, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2. I go to right there, and it'll give me the answer. So, uh, if I do the next row, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1, right? And I had five runners and three move on, right? I could do five times four times three, divided by three times two times one. Those cancel out. That becomes a two. I get a ten. Well, if I go down to the fifth row, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and I count over three, zero, one, two, three, right there is ten. Okay, what if I did the next row down, right? 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, 6, 1. Okay, and I did 6 runners, 4 move on. 6 runners, 4 move on. Right? Well, I'm going to have 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 over 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Cancel out, cancel out, 2, 3, I get 15. Well, if I go down to the 6th row, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Right there, 15. Okay, isn't that interesting? There's another reason why we do this. Because it gives us a connection. If I wanted to do x plus 1 times x plus 1, times up until x plus 1, and I'm multiplying it by itself n times, n times, how can I write it? Right? I'll, I'll do an example, 2 times. So I'm going to have x plus 1 times x plus 1. I'm going to distribute this entire thing into both of these. Okay, So I'm going to have x times x plus 1, and then plus x plus 1. Distribute the x, and I get x squared plus x plus x plus 1, or x squared plus 2x plus 1. What you may notice, invisible 1 out there, 1, 2, 1. 1, 2, 1. Okay, so let's take that result, right? So x squared plus 2x plus 1, and let's multiply it by x plus 1, okay? I'm going to do it the easy way, x cubed plus 3x squared plus 3x plus 1. If you do it out, you, you, can, you will get this. 1, 3, 3, 1, right there. So, what's the reasoning behind this? I'm going to do an inductive proof, basically meaning I'm going to assume it for some number n, right? And then I'm going to prove it for n uh, plus 1. So I'm going to have x plus 1 to the power of n times x plus 1. 
Right now, I'm just going to multiply it by x plus 1 again. And remember, because we're doing induction, this right here is going to be the sum of, I'll, I'll write it like this. I'll just do the fifth row for an example, right? 1x to the uh, sixth row, sorry. 1x to the sixth plus 6x to the fifth plus 15x to the fourth plus 20x to the third plus 15x squared plus 6x plus 1. And I'm multiplying this by x plus 1, right? I'm not going to want to do that. Well, what you may notice is that if I do x to the 6th times x, that's just going to give me x to the 7th. If I do x to the 5th times x, that's the same as me doing x to the 5th times x is going to give me some coefficient x to the 5th. But if I do, uh, sorry, x to the 6th, if I do x to the 6th times 1, I get some coefficient x to the 6th, right? What's this coefficient going to be? Well, it's going to be 6. This one's going to be 1, right? Okay, if I now look at x to the 4th, x to the 5th times 1 is going to give me 6x to the 5th. Okay, x to the 4th times x is going to give me 15x to the 5th, right? So what I'm doing here, when I'm multiplying by x plus 1, what I'm doing is I'm doing this, then that plus that, except you move it to the x to the 6th. Then I do that plus that. I move it there. That plus that. That plus that. That plus that. That plus that. Because if you look at it, I'm going to do this times that and that times that. Right? I could do x cubed times x and x to the 4th times 1. That will give me the same power of x, and I can combine the two. Right? So if I do 15x squared times x, that'll correspond with 20x cubed times 1 because they'll have the same power of x cubed. So I add 15 plus 20. And if you see on this diagram, 15 plus 20, 35. Okay, this one I'll have to add with 15 right there, 35. This one I'll have to add right there, it's right here in the diagram. It's going to be 21. That with that, 7. Right? 15, 6, 21. 6, 1, 7, 1. That's the idea. It's just that you're multiplying x to the 5th times 1, and that corresponds with x to the 4th times x, because they'll give you the same power. And that's how it corresponds with Pascal's triangle. That's the best way I can explain it, at least. If that didn't make sense, it's fine. Okay, so um, let's do an example. Um, x plus 1, multiply it by itself 7 times. Right? We're not actually going to calculate the 7th row of Pascal's triangle, because if you remember, what I can instead do, I'm not going to do 7, that's bizarre, 4, fourth power. If you remember, Permutations, permutations correspond with Pascal's triangle, right? So this is actually going to be, if I have four runners and one of them going, times x to the fourth, four runners and two of them going, x cubed, four runners, three of them move on, x squared, plus four runners, four of them go on, x, and then plus 1. Sorry. Uh, four of them, 0 go on. Four of them, 1 go on. Four of them, 2 go on. Four of them, 3 go on. Four of them, 4 go on. Times 1. Right? Because this, if you remember, corresponds with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 on the Pascal triangle, and then going over to the 0th place. Right there. Corresponds with going over one, going over another one, going over another one, right? So that all corresponds to Pascal's triangle. So for some reason, when you try and multiply x plus 1 by itself a bunch of times, you get permutations and statistics.
Isn't that kind of cool?